Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. And for the first time ever, I am joined in the studio <laughs> by JP Mason. Welcome Cheers. to a state of mind. What do you re- what do you make of the studio then, JP? Uh Paul, I have to say and be completely honest, I'm considered an enthusiastic person in my uh life by friends and co-workers, but uh walking in there today. It, it's like walking into a, a museum of culture that I uh, fully uh, embrace and associate with, which is Celtic and music, and uh, I, I, I absolutely love it. It's way bigger than I expected. Uh, it just, if anybody ever gets the chance to come here, you'll probably want to spend a good hour here because uh, there's so much to see. So I, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and it's kind of weird doing it here and not sitting in my flat at my desk with, <laughs> with a Celtic top behind me but um, no, it's, it's good to be here Well, I've not shown you the book box of jerseys over there as well that we need to work through Celtic oh, jerseys right. and stuff like that I know you love a Celtic jersey, JP It's overflowing It's overflowing uh, <laughs> Yeah, There's also a Hibs tea towel uh, that was presented to us by Gary John Kane of the Proclaimers uh, <laughs> Sunshine on Leith and I said to him, you know it would be a very interesting debate to be had if you've got two musicians to go head to head on this show, JP, one of them being with a Celtic state of mind and one being a hippie, to talk about you'll never walk alone again, Sunshine Leith, in terms of what is the most powerful football anthem. And I think that would be a great debate, a great discussion point, um, because you've got to have respect for Sunshine Leith as a tremendous football al- anthem, but you'll never walk alone is a bit special. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I have to say, yeah, Sunshine and Leith at Full Pelt um, at Easter Road is, especially in the kind of new Easter Road, which is, you know, a pretty impressive stadium now. Um, I have I've felt the full brunt of it, and it's... Uh, it's powerful. You can't deny it. And then seeing it at the the cup final, you know, when they when they triumphed over over evil, and uh, and and won the cup there, it was uh, it was pretty pretty great that day as well. And I know a lot of Hibs fans from living and working in Edinburgh, and uh, I was I was delighted for them that day, and delighted to see them singing that song for sure. Now you have uh, had an involvement in this neck of the woods for some time through your your musical journey, JP, which is ongoing, and that will filter in and out of our discussion as we go on. We've not spoken since last Thursday, obviously. We Declan is not with us today, but that is temporary. And can I just say that uh, the, those that are missing from uh, this week's um, collaborators, if you like, on a Celtic state of mind, don't worry, they're all well. And uh, they will be filtering back in to their seat, hopefully, in this studio. So you're looking about that studio outside there, JP, and you pointed out a couple of the uh, musical frames, and that was the Twilight Sad. Um, and obviously, you are heavily involved with that band. What are they up to now that we're free to go to gigs and we're free to get out there and watch bands live? Uh, well, they're uh, writing and recording new material and have been through it all this time. Um, you know, hoping and waiting for the green light to do gigs. And they've got a couple of gigs coming up at the Paisley Spree Festival um, next month. Um, that's just going to be James and Andy playing. Um, I think one of them sold out and one of them might have a few tickets left. So they've got that coming up. And then beyond that, um, we'll just be sort of gearing up towards planning a tour for next year and and releasing the record, um, whatever that may be, whatever it may be called. It's always... An exciting time when the band are in that kind of embryonic stage of you know writing a new record and you start to hear wee demos here and there and you get excited about that so i i'm looking forward to what they do next because they always they always like to better themselves and and try and one up the last thing that they did they're, mm-hmm. they're never the type of band that will just be like oh we'll just put anything out so i think it's going to be you know i think it's going to be good and i'm looking forward to it I always find it incredible, JP, that when we started uh, chatting and you came on to the, the first time you came on to Axon was back in the day when we used to film in, uh, you know, Stirling. And the week before that, I had been speaking to a couple of girls I went to school with. And it just so happens that they are the sisters of one of the band members of the <laughs> Twilight Sad. Um, and it was interesting how you and I had been chatting. Then I'm down there and I didn't even know that Brendan was in the band. Right. I remember him from school. I just remember him as being a good footballer. Um, but I'm texting you saying, you'll never guess what. But it was a bizarre scenario. And obviously from there, 
Um, it has developed to the point where you are on the show every single <laughs> Thursday, which is just tremendous. Um, and we look forward to seeing the band getting back. We were at our first festival as um, a production team last Friday, and it was in Dalkeith in actual fact. And uh, bands that were playing there included Kyle Faulkner and Las Vegas, as well as the Sherlocks. But um, here's one for you. You probably heard of the guy. I hadn't for, for my sins. Johnny Skinner was also playing. He was in a band previously called the Apple Scruffs. Oh, I remember them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he was playing and he blew me away. I thought he was superb, really, really good. So I'll be keeping an eye out for Johnny Skinner going forward as well. But loads of good bands and loads of good Celtic fans on the bill there as well, JP. Hi, uh, Las Vegas, big time. Uh, I, uh, I've, I'm I'm pretty good pals with them, known them for a long time through, I wrote one of their first ever reviews, uh, which I think I, I've sent you before actually, um, when they played at Cabaret Voltaire in Edinburgh, when they were a support band and they played to like 20 people and I just got to know them that night and then obviously uh, most of them are Celtic fans, Paul's not, he's he's of a different persuasion, but, mm -hmm. uh, but James is big time Celtic and uh, I've actually got a picture of me and James in uh, Heidelberg in Germany. Um, I went there with my girlfriend at the time thinking that Las Vegas were supporting Oasis and they, they were supporting Oasis, but it was the either side of the night that I went to see them. So uh, I, I saw them headline in Heidelberg and it was amazing. It was brilliant. But I've got a picture of James and James has got like an old school kind of, um, you know, like these muscle t-shirts just with the, like the, the sleeves cut off. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think he told me he got it at the bar is, and it's it's got a picture of Tommy Burns. A yellow, yellow picture of Tommy Burns' uh, face in the middle. Um, so uh, he's, 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 and he's played for Celtic and, and ah, charity games that. and yep. stuff like that. And obviously used to be a player himself. He used to play for, I think he played for Hamilton. Falkirk, maybe Falkirk. Queens Park. Yeah. Gretna. Um, now, interesting enough, you mentioned Germany. Uh, so let's have a wee chat about that. Show us your mug first and foremost. Well, uh, yeah, cheers for... Uh, Choosing the uh, Saint Pauline. I knew, I knew that you were you had a persuasion there for oh. Saint Pauline. Um, you were telling us before about your first European game because we are going to be talking Europe today on the show. First European game at Celtic Park was it? Yeah, today in 1996. Um, I've been putting up like pictures of programs. Just uh, a couple of folk liked it and said this is really like nostalgic. Laura Bradburn said herself that she liked uh, you know brought back memories. So yeah. And, what, what are we on? Uh, 9th of September, 1996, Celtic nil, Hamburg two, um, at Celtic Park. Um, got used to the got used to the sort of defeats early early doors with my first game. But I mean that looking back at the team this morning, it was like Tom Decanio, Van Hoydonk, and Cadetti all playing at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. and somebody one of the uh, Barry, I think it was, had come back and said, I don't think that they ever really played that much together. All four of them. You know, and maybe somebody could correct us on that. I don't know, but um, I remember that. I remember being excited because it was under the lights and going to a game at night. And but I didn't know about the Hamburg St. Pauli thing. Uh, I had no idea until being at the game, and then there was loads of St. Pauli scarfs mm -hmm. and the going up. And I was like, "What?" I said to somebody, "Why are who, who are these guys?" And they're like, "They don't like Hamburg, <laughs> and Hamburg don't like them." And um, a year later, I met my mate Michael, and he'd been at the away leg of the Hamburg trip, and that's and he'd become fully immersed in the Jolly Roger, and uh, oh, you yeah. know, going there, and uh, you know, the St. Pauli fans had kind of embraced the Celtic fans at that time, and and uh, aye, so I, I, that that was, and, and eventually a few years later, I got to go to Hamburg Celtic away under Tony Mowbray, and we got a nil nil. Remember two thousand and nine? Yeah. Um, and uh, and then obviously I've been to St. Pauli maybe three or four times. And I know everybody kind of thinks it's a bit jingoistic to be, oh, you're a Celtic fan, you're a St. Pauli fan. You, how can you like all these clubs? Go to a St. Pauli game and then come back and talk to me mm -hmm. because it's absolutely unbelievable. And all the Celtic stuff that's happening, the Green Brigade have lifted a lot of that St. Pauli fan culture and fan atmosphere. And I've got videos of a stag do I was on in... 2004 or five, a guy called Paddy Kelleher who was in our, who's still in our, uh, my old supporters club, Harriet Watt, and we went in a stag do. And I've got really ropey videos on YouTube of us singing, and it's all the, you know, that's the way I ha 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 like it, you know, and not like all of that is, it's all been lifted from St. Pauli, not all of it, but a good, a good amount of it. 
So uh, I go go to a game and then talk to me. Definitely. Well, I went to Hamburg and it was, again, a stag do for my brother. And the reason we went there was uh, threefold. St. Paul, I wanted to get in about the culture there and find out a wee bit more about it. The Beatles, um, oh, yeah. obviously, were synonymous with, with Hamburg and there's loads of wee cafes and different places there to visit. And Adidas, I've, I've got uh, quite nearby a big warehouse uh, of trainers that, that um, <laughs> I think were not distributed outside of Germany. Right. So... My big brother being a big sneaker freaker, he wanted to see all this kind of stuff. I find it utterly bizarre. <laughs> but uh, I was right into the St. Pauli thing. and uh, Did you get to a game? Well, they were playing Nuremberg that day away. Right. So we watched it in the Jolly Roger. Oh, nice. We watched it. And we had the iPad set up. Thankfully, the, the barmaid came over and gave us iPad with Celtic TV on it. We watched <laughs> Celtic playing Inverness. <laughs> uh, when Tony Watt scored a couple of goals up there. Um, so it was a great experience, but it is relevant to today talking about friendships with clubs because we're going to use this as a segue into talking about one of our new signings because the tagline today is Giacomakis, Jota, Scales, Juranovic and Carter Vickers. Who starts against Ross County? Who will make their Celtic Park debuts against Ross County on Saturday? Uh, I won't have a chance to talk about the game until Saturday because there will be... Um, Jim, Laura and Tony on tomorrow's bulletin so let's have a wee chat about that and the relationship aspect of it is that we've got another new club uh, in our canon in Catholic United uh, I love the way that that's developed over the last few weeks and uh, I was reading my interest on Twitter that their supplier of jerseys JP cannot keep up with demand and yet and yet so they can't put in another order for another few months or something mm. they've completely run out of jerseys pin badges player sponsorship um i mean it would be good to uh, sponsor something but they ran out so we did contact them for axon to sponsor a player um and it's all about these friendships and obviously he has been asked about it <clears throat> uh cameron carter vickers was asked about it on one of the celtic tv interviews we hope to get an interview with him as well there was one set up earlier this week with Yota, and we will be showing the last couple of bits of footage from that today. Um, we are in a, a couple today, one with Liam Scales. That's Kevin Graham that's speaking to Liam Scales. Cool. Uh, we're in another press conference with Fran Alonso, and it's Colin Watt who's looking after Fran because they're quite pally now, I think. <laughs> um, and yesterday's, I think it was yesterday, where Giacomakis has been postponed to next week. So it's great to get in about these new players. Uh, but Cameron Carter Vickers, the, the reason I bring him up is because let's have a look at the potential um, questions or dilemmas that Ange is going to have on Saturday. By bringing in uh, Carter Vickers, does that give him a dilemma or do you still think that the first two picks at centre back at the moment are Welsh and Starfelt until such times, JP, that one of them um, is suspended or injured or loses their form? I mean, I think with the fact that we've got the European game next Thursday, I think there's got to be possibly having one eye on that to maybe think about bringing somebody in. But these guys haven't played. If you're going to, if you're wanting to play your first choice as Welsh and Starfelt on Thursday in Spain, then these guys haven't. I mean, Welsh hasn't. Oh, Welsh played for under 21s, didn't he? He did, I. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Starfelt wasn't involved in Sweden games. So you don't want them being that if you're going to go with them and you're just going to chuck these guys in, because I don't know how much football Carter Vickers has played, you know, so far this, this year, even not even the season, but like this year. So um, it might be an idea to, 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 to start Carter Vickers. I would be more inclined to, to, to go with who you're going to play with on Thursday, mm -hmm. like uh, on Saturday. So I don't, I don't think there's going to be just this this huge introduction of all the new players. Might be completely wrong. I don't know how to second guess a manager that I've only known for a couple of months in the job. You know, um, you know that in previous previous managers just went with their tried and tested quite a lot. You know, and until such time as it was a you know an injury or a suspension or something, and then they introduced a new player. But um, I, I would I would tend to think that they would he would go with his strongest side, despite the fact that it's you know. Ross County at home. Ross County beat us last season at home. Yes. So we can't we can't take this game lightly. It would be a very good indication of how far we've come in a year mm -hmm. to show like what we do on Saturday. Do we go out and, and absolutely blitz them like we have done in previous two home games, or is it going to be you know Nietzsche Peachy? I don't know, but I'd, I'd like to think it's the the former, especially with the firepower that we've got. I know we've lost a bit in Christie and Edward, but we've brought in you know a badder. 
hopefully Kyogo Furuhashi is okay after this uh, injury scare on international duty. And then, uh, you know, you've got Yota as well, who looks fit and firing. Um, and Jack Amakis as well, who I think has been playing. Might be wrong. Has he been playing so far this season? Has he played any games? Um, I'm, I need to check if he's played this season. I've kind of mm. focused uh, my attention on that incredible season he had mm. in the last campaign, JP. It'd be a good, it would be good to, to check that out. But th- this also leads us into the fact that we're coming off the back of an international break but it's not a break, you know, and you, you concern yourself with things like, you know, Kyogo comes off early against China. Mm. Um, just when you're looking at the prospect of the three-pronged kind of attack of Yota, Kyogo and Abada, which is frightening, a frightening prospect. Um, and then you're thinking, well, Roger, you've got the travel that he's had to endure uh, to come back mm. and perhaps start on Saturday. You've got players like Welsh who played for the under-21s, actually captained under-21s, and there might be wee strains and sprains here and there, unfortunately. Um, and with a, a squad like Celtic, you've always, always got, you know, uh, well into double figures, the amount of people who are on international duty. I think Starfield got half an hour oh, um, for Sweden. Right. But um, I, I'm a bit reluctant to throw people in willy-nilly and, mm. unless it is absolutely necessary. But there are a few, as I say, areas in the, the team against Ross County and it would be interesting to know. So you're going to go with Welsh and Starfield. You'd be quite happy to, to stick with those two. I think with an eye on Thursday, I think that would make sense. Um, I, I, I'm curious to see Juranovic at right back, just to see how... I, mean, I thought he played as well as he would could be expected to against uh, Rangers at left back in an uncomfortable position but a lot of people commented on the whole way that it upset the balance mm. you know in the way that it, it just didn't look completely natural the way he was having to take the take the ball and receive the ball so I, I'd like I'd like I, I don't want to just bounce Anthony Ralston out of the team because he doesn't deserve to be to be dropped um, so and plus he hasn't played over this period as well so again are you and you're not playing Ralston on Saturday and then playing him on Thursday and then he's not kicked the ball for, what, a couple of weeks. Um, I, I think you've got to have an eye on, on Thursday as, as to how you play on Saturday. So it, it, it's, it's quite, it's quite you know, intriguing to, mm. to be analysing this team on Saturday because you don't you don't really know what's going to happen. We've, got, we've suddenly got options. Yes. You know, we've been so starved of options in all areas of the park and now we actually have options and, you know, Hopefully in the next month or so, we'll have even more options with Julian coming back and, um, you know, Mikey Johnston, whoever else. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and Greg Taylor's obviously out at the moment, so he might be forced to play Juranovic at left back again. This is one of the dilemmas. And um, I'm going to throw another name into the, the mix as well. But before I do so, you mentioned Julian. Where are you on the Julian question? I remember you bringing up that moment where he's collided with the, the post. 100%. Um, I'll stand by that. And, and I think, see, when, when I look back to Julien, there, there was quite a lot that I, I really, really loved about him with regards to the fact that he could actually score goals mm. from from defence. Um, some people would suggest that him and I, are in terms of a partnership, were the best partnership we've had for a while. And, mm. you know, probably the stats would suggest that was the case. Mm. Um, he's coming back in. There's, there's a huge amount of expectancy that he's going to come back and and sort out a lot of the problems we've had at the back, particularly at mm. set pieces. But when we think back to when he was there, we tended to have some issues, you know, the same issues at set pieces when he was in the team mm. as well, JP. And I know that when a player's out, Bobo Balde style, they become the best player in the world or Derek Riordan, um, mm. play Riordan. But, you know, maybe he's not showing it <laughs> at training every single day when Strachan's training him. If he's even at training. <laughs> I, if he's even there. Um, so th- there is this thing around Julien. I, I do still view him as the first choice centre-back to play alongside A and other. The fact that uh, Carter Vickers has come in, I think means that Uruguay will not be considered for a first-team jersey at the moment because by all accounts, he's not quite there at that level. Mm. So it's good to have that, that option on the bench that is a more solid option, particularly... In Europe, I mean, I wouldn't like to throw in Uruguay in one of these European games, for example, if someone gets injured. No. So Julien, you know, when he does come back, and the fact that he's been named in the European squad mm. for the Europa League would suggest that it's imminent. Is he the first pick? And how pivotal is his return? I don't think he's... I mean, look, we paid, what, £7 million quid for him? <laughs> you know, you, you like to think if you've paid that level of money for somebody that, you know, you're going to get a, a return... <laughs> 
when you come back from an injury, you'd never know how it was going to go. I mean, that that injury that he sustained against Dundee United was absolutely horrendous. I I, I don't think I've winced as badly at an injury probably since Larson. Um, you know, when he hit when he cracked his knee, you just knew straight away that's really really bad. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody possibly could have thought that it was the clunk be... as well. You could hear it because the yeah. stadium was empty. Of course, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't think anybody could have foreseen that it would be a year that he would be out. I mean, that is a hell of a long time to be out, and it was so avoidable. I know people have sort of said, "Oh, if you had a decent goalkeeper, he wouldn't have had to do that," and blah blah blah. I mean, these things happen in football. It's just unfortunate that you know it could have been what. A half a meter either side of that post, and he'd probably just hit his, you know, you know, his shoulder or you know, whatever. But it was the fact that it was his knee bang on. So I, I mean, I, I think Julian had his critics. You know, there's no doubt about it. Before he, you know, got that injury, there was nobody that was saying that he was, you know, he's not an international, for example. You know, <laughs> we paid seven million for him, mm -hmm. and he's not an international. He's nowhere near the French team. Never, I don't think, has been. Um, but you'd think he'd be good enough at our level um, to to be a commanding centre half, and I I would think if he gets back to fitness, he's got to be a first name in the team sheet, and then a and other after that. Um, I really hope he still wants to be here. I hope he's not one of the players because let's face it, he could be one of the players that Neil Wenham was referring to after Ferenc Varos. We mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever really confirmed. I think we can gather that it is Ayer. Edward Christie, but could he have been one of the people that wanted to leave? We don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. he certainly gives the impression online, you know, from his posts and everything that he's into it and happy at, at, in Glasgow and at Celtic. So uh, I hope that that is the case and he comes back and he's got the bit between his teeth and wants to put right uh, what's gone wrong in the last 18 months because he enjoyed success and he said to sit in the sideline and watch all this just Aye. unravel and he's not. I can't imagine how frustrating that would be as a footballer if you actually give a SHIT about what you're doing uh, to be able to just sit there and watch this, you know, absolute nightmare unfold in front of you. So that motivation surely should be within him to come back and go, right, let's let's try and uh, sort this out. You know? Yeah, I, I think about him and I just want him to get back into that uh, kind of way where he plays, you know, uninterrupted for a, quite a spell because mm. you think about when he, when he came in and for some unknown reason uh, in the European game, the Cluj game it was, where yeah. we got knocked out, um, the decision was made by the then manager, Neil Lennon, to put him and Bolingoli on the bench, who were mm. brand new signings, £10 million worth of new players, uh, to the point where I'm a big uh, fan of playing players in their position. <laughs> so rather than play Callum McGregor left back, why not play the new left back that we've just signed? Mm. So he missed out in that game and that that frustrated the life out of me. Uh, you're thinking about big performances against the likes of Lazio and, and Rangers, mm. for example. But then people throw in, you know, Lyndon Dyke spooked him. He couldn't play against a big imposing forward, etc. And that kind of thing. Then he's part and parcel of the Dubai fiasco, even though he shouldn't have been there. You know, it wasn't his decision. He's been yeah. dragged along and, you know, so the whole thing there, I just want him to get back. When he comes back from an injury layoff, um, he then has his big injury against Dundee United and he's off for nine months. I just want him to get back into the, the way of playing for four, five, six months with no issues whatsoever because I still think, uh, although we've had good performances out of him, there's, we've still to see the best from him. You know, and it, it sounds strange. You're saying he's not an international. Absolutely. We signed Eddie at nine million who hadn't, made his international breakthrough, you know, full international. But he was part of that under-20 World Cup winning squad mm. with France. Um, and I just think that every single time he gets going, something happens and it derails his kind of progress with Celtic. Yeah. I, I still think, even though we signed him a wee bit later, he was a bit like Boyata. I think Boyata was 26 when we signed him. Mm. Um, he still probably viewed Celtic as that kind of stepping stone to another move. I, I still think as a player, he felt, that he was going to get that big move. Mm. But because of injuries and everything else that's happened, it's just never materialised. And it would be great if he just comes in, shows up that defence, gets a partnership with, you know, be that Starfelt, Carter Vickers, Welsh, whoever it is playing, you know, the, their best football, with Joe Hart at the back. And we're just a completely uh, different team to play against at that stage, JP. So want to look forward to another season in the European squad. I'm always keen to get in about these comments, uh, JP. So let's uh, start off 
with Barry McGinty. Thank you for tuning in and you're on YouTube. Uh, first to leave a like and a comment. Hail, hail. I listen to the podcast every morning. Barry, welcome to the show. And it is important to give us a thumbs up on YouTube because obviously there are some lurkers out there, JP, who don't even watch the show who <laughs> like to give us the, the thumbs down. Um, and I've noticed by mentioning that we get about 200 more than we normally do. So thanks for all your support, <laughs> guys. Uh, Paddy Lavery, how many of the Axon team are attending the awards night? Listen, you brought up, so I'm going to talk about it, JP, because people are saying you're just flogging a dead horse with these awards. <laughs> Paddy brought it up. Well, the way this works is um, you're kind of taken by surprise. And I guess being involved with the bands and stuff like that, JP, you'll have been in similar situations where you get contacted and you're told you're in the finals of this awards ceremony. We didn't even get that. We didn't. We weren't even informed that we were in it. It's just someone texted us and uh, tweeted us or something. You're like, wow, that's tremendous. So I announced that we've got a nomination for an award. And then Kelvin, who's the videographer in the studio, says, no, actually, we're in two categories. And then somebody else tells us we're in three. So I was so excited to announce it. I didn't even look through all the categories. Just thought, wow, we've scraped into the charitable one. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then you're invited down to London. But unfortunately, I think because they're probably missing at least one year's worth of uh, finance, that I'm talking about the awards company, um, you know, there's no complimentaries or anything available to anyone. So, you know, it's basically a wee email out or a WhatsApp out to the group who is up for this and not everybody can jump on a training while we're down to London for a night, you know, with all their other responsibilities. But we are hoping that we've got a wee squad going down, uh, maybe five or six strong, uh, and hopefully we can bring an award up. What I've started doing, JP, I should have been doing it three weeks ago. I've got the link in the bottom of the video. So if you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch, um, there is a link. Click it. And if you can give us a vote, it would be greatly appreciated. So thank you for bringing that up, Paddy. I really uh, appreciate it. Gerald McEwen, also watching on YouTube. Whoever starts, I'm sure we'll see some rip-roaring, free-scoring, never-boring football borrowed Tony Haggerty's phrase. And... You should borrow it. It's a great phrase. But there are a few other dilemmas. Now, we've been talking about the centre-half situation. Um, I was probably a bit premature in my comments around Liam Scales when it became clear that we were going to be bringing him in from Shamrock Rovers. Now, it really wasn't down to the fact that I was looking down my nose at any other league JP. I just felt that he looked like the type of signing that in the past we might have called a project signing. Someone who you bring in who you don't maybe think is first team ready and who gets up to speed over a period of months and then he starts getting bled into the team. And we've done it so often in the past. And I think, we're, you know, that's where Liam Shaw is and I think that's where Osazi Urugidi is. Mm. And I felt that maybe Liam Scales is the same. But instantly, when I said that, I was informed, you're wrong. Mm. This guy is first team ready. So where do you think he is in the pecking order? I mean, we've been speaking about Taylor being out. Do you think we might see an yeah. appearance for Liam Skills yeah, left back? I do. I think. I think. I think it would be. There's no point in playing Juranovic. The Juranovic thing at Ibrox was obviously a needs must because I think putting Montgomery in there, <laughs> fifty thousand Rangers fans. Yeah. You know, I, I know. I know that as a football player, you have to, you know, deal with whatever's thrown at you. I still. Uh, would say that about you know the Saka thing and Saka taking the penalty for England. You know it's like he's he's a, he's a striker. He's in the squad. You know what what you're going to do? Hide. You know you've got to, you've got to do the job that's asked of you. It just so happened that was a final and it was a crucial penalty and blah blah blah. But you know he had to take it. But it's the same thing, sort of with Montgomery. But I can understand why you know he did he didn't want to throw Montgomery to into the. The lion's den, even though there's there's no lion's den though, is they? Um, <laughs> um, so um, oh, I, brilliant! Yeah, like there, uh, so there was that. But um, I, I think I think because Skills has been playing, you know, you and I both know Skills has been playing. He's been playing in Europa League qualifiers for uh, Shamrock Rovers, scored in one of them, uh, decent header. And the more people I've heard talk about this is that he will probably suit. Ange Postacoglu's system is being a guy that can come in and go into the middle as a and sort of end up playing sort of inside mm -hmm. an inside half, if that's what it's called. I don't know. I'm not an expert on football tactics and never have claimed to be, but um I I've read a bit about him as a player and read about what people have said about him who've watched him. And you don't think that you'd get people 
you know, seemingly saying in tweets or whatever, saying, look, I've seen this guy play. He can play, you know. Mm -hmm. like, I, and normally when people say that, you tend to take them with a bit of authority, you know, like rather than it just being like throw away or or wishful thinking or something like that. Like, I, I, I actually do think, I mean, the fact that we've given the number five straight away makes you think that there's been faith put in him by, by the club and by the manager. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think there's every chance he'll play on Saturday, possibly with a view to 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 playing on Thursday as well, because you don't want to just throw him in on Thursday in Spain. Um, I know that that may not phase him at all, but I watched his interview uh, with Celtic, and uh, I just I like the cut of his jib. And he's, I know Russell has said this before. You know, remember when we were talking about Stepping Stone FC and all of that. Mm. You get the feeling that Liam Skills is is you know delighted to be at Celtic and realizes that it's a massive opportunity and he's not just thinking one eye on the Premier League or whatever. He's thinking, no, I'm I'm at Celtic. This is amazing. You know, like I've got a Celtic badge on my on my chest. You know, that, that this is a a big deal. So that type of player who has already got pedigree and has already got skill. Um, is the type of player you want at Celtic, isn't it? You want somebody that's that's you know going to ask for another brick wall to run through mm -hmm. after yeah. he's run through the first one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the past, I think we have brought players in with no real fanfare who have gone on to be established members uh, of the Celtic side. Um, I think once you get into the transfer window, maybe we're all a, a bit guilty of looking for the kind of bigger name players coming in. And maybe that, maybe I was guilty of that when Liam Scales, you, you're thinking he's coming for Shamrock Rovers, mm. um, he's played all his football in Ireland, perhaps he's a project. And then, you know, 23 year old, you know, you think, why has he not made that move yet? Um, I think I'm going to be proven wrong and I'll be delighted to be proven wrong. But when you're looking at playing players in their positions, which I think is an absolute necessity if you can, and you play him at left back due to the injury of Greg Taylor, mm. um, then it gives you another dilemma, a secondary dilemma at right back. So um, would Taylor feel as, uh, would Ralston rather feel as though he's, he's being dropped um, or just rested? Because let's be honest, he's done nothing in terms of his performance mm. to merit being dropped. And I think that if Ange Postacoglu has that mentality amongst the squad, then he misses the game against Ross County, uh, maybe so that Juranovic uh, could come in and play it right back in his natural position. Mm. But that would only be due to the fact that we can't play Juranovic at left back because we're going to be playing a, a naturally left-sided player at left back. Mm. Although, given all these reasons, and it makes sense, there will still be a sense of disappointment if Ralston doesn't get that right back jersey, I would feel. Which is wild that we are saying that. I know. Um, but maybe the maybe the ideal scenario is, you know, obviously the ideal scenario would be to to go a couple of goals up against Ross County and put the game to bed and then sub Ralston and bring Juranovic on mm -hmm. and give him, you know, uh, and give Ralston. So you've given Ralston a run out, he's got minutes in the legs to coin the old phrase. And then uh, and then he, and then Ralston starts on, on Thursday. I mean because again, it would be really harsh on Ralston. Ralston was great at Ibrox. I thought I didn't think he put a foot wrong. Really, like you can't blame him for anything bad that happened in the game. The the, the goal was a goal. It was a clever goal because they 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 crowded out. Um, they crowded out the centre halves and had an extra man at the back who's probably one of the biggest men in the pitch. And he just you know got in there and it was. I don't know if it was tactical or not. Um, but if it if it was, then fair play, you know. But it wasn't. I, there's no no blame apportioned to. I think everybody wanted to blame Starfelt, but I, I don't blame Starfelt for that goal. I, I blame the fact that they had a bigger centre half. Um, I don't think it was a disastrous corner. It was a decent ball in, and and they took their chance, and that was what won the game for them. So, you know, we on another day. <laughs> Eddie puts that goal in. I mean, you could see how gutted Eddie was when he missed that. You know, he genuinely. I, I still don't. I still don't subscribe to this. Eddie was not trying part because I, I, you could see he was gutted, and what I think that would have been to leave us with. You know, I, I, I'm, I, have I been on since Eddie left? Yeah, I have because that was last week, wasn't it? Because um, oh, we spoke about the Stone Roses Crystal oh, Palace of video. Yeah, yeah, we did. I, yeah. Um, but I know. I, I, th I think maybe that's the answer. Is as Ralston starts and then see how the game goes and then bring Juranovic on and give Juranovic a run out at Celtic Park. And then he's got minutes in his legs as well because I don't know if he was involved in, in a national duty um, over the over the course. I, probably he must have been. If he was starting against Scotland in the Euros, he must have been in, in the Czech 
uh, set up. So, um, but Ralston hasn't played, has he? Ralston's not played. No, and he was actually, you know, overlooked when Nathan Patterson dropped out. He, yeah. was, he was overlooked uh, due, due to the fact that uh, there was medical reasons uh, that he wasn't in the oh, really? pulled into the, the Scotland squad. So it could well be something that, you know, is a decision that's taken out of Angie's hands. But mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Juranovic, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's got 13 caps for Croatia in 2017. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's a fairly regular um, contributor in recent times, certainly, since mm -hmm. making his debut a few years back. But again, that, that could well be a decision that's taken out of Angie's hands if indeed it's a COVID-related mm -hmm. issue, uh, for example. Um, but when we're looking throughout the, the whole team, there are these dilemmas and it will be interesting to see um, how we line up. There's a few other players I would like to see more of, um, but I'm going to be bringing up as many comments as I possibly can. And uh, we have Follow Celtic who supports Axom and has done for a long, long time. You're commenting on Twitter via Periscope, bouncing for the game, bring on the newbies. It's always good to see new signs. Talking about first European games, I forgot to say, I was trying to think what my first uh, European game was, and I'm sure it was Geminal Ekerin. Um, Neuchatel Zamax at home won nothing. Was it even the same season? Listen, I need to check Celtic Wiki. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they're two games that I remember from the kind of early 90s period mm. where um, we were going through a very tough patch. But in terms of Europe, uh, you know, one or two rounds was your max. I mean, oh, even the centenary season, you think I was getting bounced out by Borussia Dortmund. Yeah. And people look back fondly and, you know, Derek White and Andy Walker scoring and we beat them 2-1. Murdo McLeod's playing for Borussia Dortmund. But we're getting bounced out of Europe in the first and the second rounds back then. I, I you mean, know? I didn't see European football beyond Christmas until pff, Martin O'Neill, probably. Like, mm. I, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, like, you're talking the whole of the 90s and then Martin O'Neill, uh, yeah, I mean, it must have been post post like 2003, maybe Seville was the first time. I don't know. I, I can't remember if we went further beyond Seville, uh, further beyond uh, Christmas before Seville. That's a that's a good uh, a good pub quiz question if ever there was one. But uh, I I mean Seville might be that that time. So that's that's me being supporting Celtic for like 15 years at that mm. point, mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen us beyond Christmas in Europe. <laughs> uh, pretty sad state of affairs. It is because. It's your timeline and it's just your, your point of reference. But I remember um, when, when I started going myself to the games, no matter where you are in terms of your, your point of reference, you get fed the stories of the great European nights mm. and the Lisbon lines and you learn the team line just it flows off the tongue like the alphabet, you know, and if you don't know Simpson, Craig, Gemmell, Modern McNeil, et cetera, then you're even a Celtic fan, you know, that, that was always the kind of attitude. But you're going to watch these really inept Celtic sides and you're hearing about all these great stories. And then you start digging about, and the last time post Christmas that we had been in Europe when I started going uh, in '87 was 1980, and it was Real Madrid in the quarter final of the European Cup, where we beat them two nothing at home. Goal scored by George McCluskey and the late Johnny Doyle. We go over to the Bernabeu and they beat us three 0 and they bounce us out three two. And I've interviewed a couple of the players that was involved in that that uh, tie. Um, and they reckon that, you know, the referee was on the take uh, mm. over in Spain. And they said, you know, that that was one of the things that back then was happening. You know, players were going to clubs and managers were passing brown envelopes here, there and everywhere. And they said, you know, it also happened on, on the kind of refereeing level as well. Mm. But, um, you know, 3-2 against Real Madrid back then, Johnny Doyle scoring at Celtic Park. We had Paul McQuaid in here just the other week talking about the know, new Paul. biography mm -hmm. uh, of Johnny Doyle. So we'll have that video up. Very, very soon. We've been kind of busy, JP, with all the, the festival footage last week, so we've not been able to get it out, but hopefully we'll get it out in the next few days. We've also got an interview with Brian McClare um, out there in the studio for a chat show that I've started up called Tartan Taste Buds. Um, and we do have them sampling some bizarre Scottish delicacies. Um, and we talk about football and politics and music and Chalky's just He's great. He's amazing. He's great. Uh, he actually mentioned you when he seen the Twilight Sad thing out there. So Aye. we've got loads of good shows coming up. And uh, up talking, going back to Sunshine and Leith, I interviewed Gary John Kane, big Celtic man, bass player out of the Proclaimers, uh, but he also runs Button Up Records and his band is called Button Up. And I've got an interview coming out 
from him as well. So loads of good interviews with a wee Celtic tinge here and there where, where I can, JP, as you always do. Um, but when we're to- talking about the, the possible lineup on Saturday, another thing I'd like to throw in there, it's kind of twofold, I guess, is when I was on yesterday talking to Patrick, we spoke about the midfield position mm-hmm. and we had a discussion about the fact that I think that was the one area that we probably could have brought in another player. Mm-hmm. And one of the names that we spoke about was uh, Ali McCann. And you're, you're looking at the, the transfer fee and you're thinking, well, Celtic could quite easily have, you know, gone toe-to-toe with Preston on the fee. You know, it was, I think, on the same day that Christie went for two, two and a half million quid to Bournemouth. And obviously we're up in terms of transfer fees. I, I, I know that's not ring-fenced uh, within the realms of you mm. will spend all that money. But we could have gone in for... Alan McCann and he's gone down to Preston instead um, for just over one million quid. And I think that's a, r- a right good bargain, Preston, I've got in their hands here. Earlier on in the season, I spoke up about um, Lewis Ferguson. I like him. I think he's a good player. But let's not forget about James McCarthy, who's come in. He's played two games, um, kind of cameo roles against Hearts and uh, AZ Alkmaar. We've not really seen him. Um, what he can do but I've been saying you know that I think he's going to be a player that will be a big player for Ange this season I think he's going to once he gets into his stride JP gets back up to match fitness we know that he didn't do a, a pre-season with a, with a team he did it on his own so it's maybe to be expected that he's not quite there yet is this the type of game and then I'm going to also flip it uh, just with the, the spirit of Boise there I'm going to flip it and ask what on earth is happening to Ismail Asoro so there's the two midfielders I want to talk about uh, before we get into the wingers. Uh, so James McCarthy, should we expect to see him maybe on Saturday? Is it a fitness issue? I mean, he's certainly had plenty of rest over the international break. I would be surprised if he started, to be fair. I, I, I'd hope, hope for his sake and for our sake that he's, you know, over whatever it is that he's, that's been bothering him. And if it's an injury or, or, or fitness or what, but like I'd like to see him involved to start. Possibly, but I, I think it would be maybe asking a bit much when you've not really done that much in the last well few weeks. So maybe maybe uh, maybe another one where he comes off the bench and gets a good half an hour, forty minutes um, towards the the end of the half, depending on how the game's going. Um, I think you're right. I think McCarthy could and should be an important signing. It's just it was just such a long protracted saga to get him here. You know, he was linked every single yeah. transfer window, and now he's actually here. You don't want it to be another one of these signings where he comes in, doesn't he? Just just didn't work out. You know, like I, I would hate that to be the case because you, you, there is part of you that gets that has the feeling that it might go that way because of his lack of football in the last few seasons and. You know his age, his fitness, everything else. So I, I, I really, I want to see him do well. You know, he's a Celtic fan. You always, when a Celtic fan pulls on a jersey, you always want. You know, there's that little bit more of you wants him to do well. And you know, his reception when he came on um, at Celtic Park, obviously, you can get you get from the stadium that everybody's willing him to do well. You know, Republic Ireland International, etc. Um, but sorrow, sorrow is a weird one. I think. I, I, when Sorrow came into the side, and everybody was like, "I forget Scott Brown. Sorrow's the Sorrow's the future." Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I remember at the time thinking, "I don't think he is. I think he's an okay player, but I don't think we've won a watch here." And in, in terms of like, you know, uh, we've plucked this guy out of nowhere, and we've 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 um, you know stolen a march on so many other teams by getting this guy, and nobody else knew who he was. I think he's he's quite he's. He showed even early on in his Celtic career he was quite erratic and niggly fouls, giving away fouls, always looks like a certainty to get booked <laughs> in the first 10, 15 minutes of a game. Um, he's just a bit, you know, a bit kind of loose. You know, he's not somebody that I would, you know, in the, these Europa League games, for example, I wouldn't trust Ismail Asoro as being that guy in the middle of the park. Um to go up against a Betis or a Leverkusen, you know, I just don't think that's he's he's not at that level. I mean, he's yet to even prove if he's a, uh, at league level mm-hmm. over a course, you know, over over a course of like two or three months where you're playing, you know, Saturday or Sunday and then playing on a Tuesday and all that. You've not seen Sorrow being a you know a, a name in the team sheet throughout that time, and I just don't know if 
Ange Postecoglou, you know, maybe a, a, a complete speculation. I, I have no idea, but I, I don't know if he necessarily rates him as as a as a as a sort of guy that he's going to want to have about. You're allowed to speculate. I know. We're, al- we're allowed to speculate. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the thing. Everything that comes out your mouth doesn't have yeah. to be fact as long no. as you're not selling it as fact because no, we get we get picked up for having opinions yeah. here and there so that's why i'm underlining that yeah. but my, my big thing with sorrow he comes in uh you know around about the patrick clamala time and you think well again project signings mm-hmm. you know they're all the, the kind of similar age they're going to maybe develop under the radar which you know you thought about sorrow because he was nowhere near the first team mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden he's thrown in on that, that famous occasion where Turnbull kind of comes of age mm. and uh, against Lille, very good Lille side. They proved that <laughs> that mm. season. Very, very, very good side. And I also thought that night that uh, Connor Hazard played pretty well. And mm. Ewan Henderson, who mm-hmm. doesn't seem to get a look in at the minute, he played really well that night as well. But the thing with Soro is all those attributes that were shown in that first clutch of games and then think the wheels came off it a wee bit when he got food poisoning for the Scottish Cup final. Oh, yeah. And we're really, really disappointed at that stage in December there. Mm-hmm. We're playing hearts and we're really gutted that he's out the side because you're thinking he's one at that point, one of the best performers for Celtic. And you're thinking that you've got the turnball effect, you've got the sorrow effect, and maybe the season will turn around. You kept thinking that maybe something would turn the season around and that could have been it. And inevitably it was not. But what I've seen particularly since um, the departure of Neil Lennon um, and more so since Ange Postacoglu came in, JP, is two things. If we want to play this free flow in football, you can't keep breaking up the game, not the play, breaking up the game by giving away daft fouls. Mm. And he does that a hell of a lot. He's very reckless with his challenges to the point where he's almost challenging the ref Mm. to give him a booking. Mm -hmm. He'll do it four or five times until he's in the book. But what you're doing in that, so there's, there is such a good thing as a as a good film, you know. If mm. you know you're looking back, you're Bruni thinking, right, <laughs> hey, I'm just going to take you out. I know I maybe get a book in here, but I'm breaking up this attack because you know they're on the counter. But I think he's very reckless in his challenges. Another thing is his ball retention doesn't seem to be as good no. as I thought it was when he first came into the side because I just thought the boy never loses the ball. No matter what happens, mm. he always finds a man. I don't see that as much now. And it would be good because this is an observational view. It would be good if someone looked at the stats because it seems as though he loses, you know, possession mm. a hell of a lot. And again, these are two key key um, areas of Ange Postecoglou's game, and I think that's maybe why he hasn't featured as much as as we would have expected given his performances last season. Um, so it will be interesting to see if he plays a part, and I am hoping that James McCarthy plays a part. Um, a brilliant point has came into the section, uh, the comment section, and it's from a friend of the pod, Jungle Lion, who has promised at some point, if we go over to Ireland, that we can do a, a live Axon uh, broadcast from his den. Uh, I don't know if it's called the Lion's Den, but his den, uh, which, if you look at his Twitter page, is very much right up our street in terms of Celtic memorabilia. Paul McGrath was 22 when he left St. Pat's and more or less walked straight into the Man U team. Mm. Paul McGrath. Anybody that wants to mention him, I'm going to have to go on a wee diversion here and talk about Paul McGrath because I think there's a clutch of players, particularly in the 80s and 90s JP, that I would have loved to have seen wearing the green and white hoops of Celtic. And Paul McGrath was one of them. Great point, by the way, Jungle Lion. I'm now going on a tangent, but that was a great point. Yeah, you know, coming in from the the Irish League and, and going into the Man U side. Paul McGrath, incidentally, you've not read his book, Back From The Brink, Make sure you read it. The best football book I've ever read. Absolutely astonishing story. But he, on two occasions, had an opportunity to sign for Celtic. And I sometimes think, you know, Billy McNeil wanted to sign him and Liam Brady later wanted to sign him. Had Billy McNeil signed Paul McGrath for Celtic, I imagine a defence of Paul Elliott and Paul McGrath. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And Aye. it's margins, isn't it? It's just margins because... Does nine in a row happen? You know, it's just you know, does mind-boggling. The, does the Civ continue to be called the sieve if you've got Paul McGrath there. Yeah, mm. Unlikely, mm. I would have thought. I know. Um, cause and he guy... came up. He came up to Celtic Park. He writes about it in his book. Mm. He actually came up to Celtic Park uh, when Billy McNeil was in, in charge. And uh, the other occasion, I've heard from a couple of people who were actually at the meeting and Celtic went down and met him in Manchester and 
Uh, Tom Grant, the former director, told me that story. So they they were looking to sign Paul McGrath. I would have loved to have seen it. Right. Well, I mean, that's a good point. Players coming from Irish football, obviously Dennis Irwin to United and Roy Keane to United. Well, Roy yeah. Keane is Nottingham Forest first and then United. Um, it's it's not to be sniffed at. I don't think you know. Just it's like when people say when players leave our league and go elsewhere. You know, they, they sort of downplay our league, although. Christopher Ayer's comments this week have what do you make of that? have not gone down well. <laughs> I mean, there's been so many I've seen on Twitter, so many people like just uh, retweeting his comments and then putting in like little clips of him having an absolute nightmare against you know Hearts. Hearts is left back. I saw that one and I think it was in the cup final. I know he scored the penalty, fair play, but his defensive qualities at times were questionable. So to suddenly think, oh well, you know, now I'm in the Premier League that was beneath me, you know, it's kind of like, man, just have a bit of respect about the league. A, a wee bit of humility. Aye, totally. You know? Like, wait, I mean, I, I know these things can sometimes get taken out of context or whatever, and it's just like, that was just like an image with a quote attributed to Christopher Iyer. I've got no idea of the context of the rest of the the interview, but it doesn't read well because, you know, it's just like, you, you, you clearly thought you were miles better than this league. And I think he is better than this league. But how far is yet to be determined? Mm -hmm. um, you know, ask me in two years about how far away he is from from the Scottish League, um, and see where he is. Will he still be at Brentford? <laughs> you know, because if he is still at Brentford, then you know he's not done that great, has he? Because he's not. You know, he, he's clearly thinking Brentford's my 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 next step, and then there'll be a step after yeah. that, like Van Dyke or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm saying for a second that he was. I, I always stuck up for Christopher Ayer. I said, based on transfers and transfer windows and fees and everything else, I said at one point last year, we should be looking for 20 to 25 million for Christopher Ayer. And we ended up getting, what, 13 and a half? Mm, with, rising. With a year left of his contract. Yeah. So a fully paid up, contracted Christopher Ayer could probably have gone for 20 to 25 million, you'd have thought. Um, so to get that money in pre-COVID as well aye oh yeah yep. totally as well aye, that's affected everything mm. so aye the thing with Chris Iyer with me is we have we never really have spats well there's been a couple hmm. uh, on Axon but uh, differences of views and I've had a difference of view in relation to Leo Connor and Luca Connell with Colin Watt mm -hmm. uh, Tony and I disagree on the virtues of Chris Iyer as a defender mm -hmm. um, and I totally get that because every single time uh, we were predicting scores, I always said first goal would be Chris Iyer with a, what was it? A thunderous header or <sighs> yeah, something like that. And, you know, it's never, never, it. never going to happen. <laughs> uh, and I get all that. But uh, I remember a, quite an early filmed axiom that I did with Kevin Graham, um, who I think right now will be speaking to the aforementioned Liam Scales about his uh, arrival at Celtic. And Kevin and I had a wee chat about Chris Iyer. And I spoke about Chris Iyer being a, a potential £10 million sale for Celtic. And at that time, it was kind of maybe appearing a bit premature, JP. It mm -hmm. was like, really? Mm -hmm. Do you honestly think so? Um, and it's one of the ones that I don't get to do that often, but it was like a told you so moment when I then spoke to Kevin and says, well, you know, he did develop into that player. But bigger than that for me is I remember the last international break looking at a friendly game that Norway were playing and going through their squad and there was half a dozen players in the in the Norway squad who had been partly developed or given their debuts by Ronnie Dyla. Mm. And I remember looking at that, and obviously, um, you know, Chris Iyer was one of those players who got his, you know, he he got going at Celtic under Ronnie Dyla. Uh, Martin Odegaard, the famous Martin Odegaard, who was away to Real Madrid and mm. he spent time at Arsenal, etc. But there were others. There was half a dozen players, and I just think that the legacy of Ronnie. Uh, is in player sales like Chris Iyer uh, and player sales like Kieran Tierney, for example. And even the fact that we're talking about Tony Ralston as being a first pick right back. Who gave him his debut? Mm. Ronnie. Uh, now, I'm not trying to rewrite history here, JP, and, and your captain, Kyle McGregor, who gave him his debut? Ronnie Tyler. And I'm not trying to rewrite history, but I just think that, again, had things been slightly different, you know, we could have really seen the benefit of his talent spotting skills, which I think are immense. When you look at the success he's had in helping players along in their careers, mm. um, I mean, obviously he coached Van Dyke. He, he had a partner to play in his development, spoke about it, said he had to uh, 
live his life better. We spoke to Ronnie Dial on this podcast a couple of years ago, and he spoke about Van Dyke quite openly. His lifestyle was wrong when Ronnie uh, joined Celtic, and, and he got him into this way of thinking where you're a 24 hour athlete. And you know what happened to Van Dyke, and it's not down to it's down to Van Dyke, but obviously people along the way have helped him, and I think Ronnie Dyla has been one of those guys. And I just feel that he probably should never have been Celtic's manager, but we should have definitely gone and got him and yeah. got him into the club because there was a lot of things he did well. I just don't think he was that focal point. He was the manager. Did you see the pictures of him in the New York CSC? <laughs> like, <laughs> must have been at stupid o'clock in the morning, and he's wearing like. The strip that he like was the, when he was the manager. That was our home strip. Our home strip. I think I had signatures on it as well. I'm not sure who who would signed it or whatever. But uh, what a character. Um, yeah, I, I I had a lot of time for him. I was I was kind of on board. That was I got my season ticket back in 2013. I actually, check my uh, Facebook memories today, and today's the day that I got my season ticket posted to me um, eight years ago. So I'd been in the wilderness for four four years um, after having a season ticket for 10 years and then I had a four-year hiatus and then today's the day that I got my season ticket back in the North Stand and I've been there ever since. So all through the dialer, the dialer time, you know. Um, and I just like this. I like to see a guy with enthusiasm for the for the job and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think he appreciated the post, you know, and certainly seeing him, you know, now and beyond being at Celtic, he's obviously still a fan. And you know, why would you go to a bar in he's New York? Never, like, he's <laughs> never said a bad word about Celtic no. or Scottish football. No, you know. No. Um, and I think that it took its toll on Ronnie Dyer. Oh, it really took its toll that the the job. And uh, as Celtic fans, we we look back fondly on him. There's a few other dilemmas on that uh, team line for Saturday, JP, and one of them is obviously due to the fact that Kyogo was injured and we hope that he's fit. Mm. I mean, we've not had an update. We really hope that he's fit. All it takes is probably a, a press conference today with the, the media and Ange will be asked the question about who's fit and who's not after the international break and Kyogo is the one that's on everybody's mm. lips at the moment. So um, I'm, I'm thinking, and I said this yesterday, we showed most of the video footage. I was going to show you the rest today, but once you and I get talking about Celtic and music, <laughs> no chance. Uh, we will show the clips at some point on the socials though. Um, I'm thinking of this three-pronged attack of Kyogo being the the centre point of that, bad on the right mm -hmm. and Yota on the left. And I just think in terms of potential, we were talking about your first European game. We've been speaking about the three amigos. Talk about three amigos. There's there's three true mm. uh, ballers right there. And that fills me with a lot of excitement. Um, if we can get all three of them firing on all cylinders, JP. Oh, no, definitely. And uh, just when you were laying it out there, I was just thinking of the song, we've got a badder on the wing, and <laughs> Kyogo doing his thing. And now you've got Yota, who is a bit of an unknown quantity for us, but... I've heard a bit about him at one point, maybe what a year or two ago, he was being rated as like nine million or whatever like that. So maybe Yota is a, a Portuguese version of a player like, say, Chris Sutton or Scott Sinclair or something like that. You know, a, a player that's just maybe lost his way a little yeah. bit at a club and then needs to find the right place because you're not talking about that with Colin recently on a podcast where you were, I think it was the Sunday one you did the impromptu one where you were talking about how. Sometimes players just don't fit in at a club, and then they go elsewhere, and they yeah. become mainstays, and end up being, you know, a you know a legend or a regular at least. Um, so Yota might be one of those guys, and I hope he is. I mean, we've not, we've not. I don't think we've got much wrong in the transfer market so far, from what I can see as a fan, looking at what the, what they've done in the in the in the in the window since it opened. That there's no real obvious. Everyone's going on about Starfield. I don't think Starfield's a bad player. Um, I think just give him time. You know, if, if in a year's time everybody's still saying things about him, then fine. But I just think he'll be all right. But everybody else seems to be okay. And, you know, obviously Yota's brand new to the equation. But if he can do on the left what Abada can do on yeah. the right, then I would be a bit concerned if I was a... Uh, <laughs> a centre half or a right back, you know, because he'll, he'll terrorise them. No, you're right. And uh, you're talking about Starfield there. I think one point to make is that when he's doing a defensive side of the, the game, he mm -hmm. does that well. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always think that the only heart in the mouth moment you get with Starfield is where he's got the ball at his feet and a wee bit too much time to think about it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and we've seen the same, and I'm not comparing them before you think I am. We've seen the same with Duffy. Duffy would probably not used to having the ball at his feet mm. as much as he did when he came to Celtic, and he was just the wrong fit. He was the wrong fit, and yeah. that's what happens with players. I think the example I gave previously, that two great examples you've just given with Sutton and Sinclair, you know, being revitalised by coming to Celtic. Um, Timu, Timu Puki. Yeah. You know, I remember watching him. He played, He scored a couple of goals in the game we played at Murrayfield under Ronnie Dyler. Mm. Uh, the 4-2 game. Was it 4-2 that day? 4-0. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, at Murrayfield. And you're looking at him thinking, oh, maybe we're at that, that point where you think maybe he will be a player for Celtic. Mm-hmm. But he just never really got going. And he's gone on to be an unbelievable player for Norwich. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these things happen. But the big question for me, if Kyogo's injured, we've then got a, a, another dilemma on the park. Do you throw in Giacomakis or do you play Albion a Yeti? I think he's more than like, in, uh, more likely to play a Yeti, I would have thought. I mean, a Yeti, I can't remember what game was it recently where a Yeti came on and won one the ball which led to a goal was it was it, was it at Celtic Park I'm I think it was sure. St Minnan was it yeah and I know you know the least you expect is commitment and you know putting yourself about when you come on that's what you want to see from a substitute anyway um, but I would him coming on at least shows that the manager's got some faith in him because he's got minutes you know yeah. he's not he's, he's in the squad he's in he's in and about and he's getting time so You'd think that based on maybe just even that cameo appearance that he would get a start against, you know, no disrespect, but Ross County in the league at home. You, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sorry, but if you're a footballer and a striker for Celtic has cost five million quid and you can't A, get a start in a game like that at the weekend, then there's no point in you being there really, is there? Like, <laughs> let's face it, you know, you'd be, you should be looking for a move in January if Kyogo is out injured. A yet he's got it. You'd think, and in, in the natural process of players coming in and getting bedded in, you'd be you'd feel pretty hard done by if you were Albi a yeti if you got bounced out for a guy that's literally just in the door. Yeah. Um, so no, you're, it's a good point, and I think the the case of a yeti. Uh, we've we've spoken about the case of um, other players in, in terms of where they're going to be standing. Uh, Jungle Lines points just popped up there. It was such a good point. It came up by itself. Mm. Um, but the case of a Yeti, I think that if he hasn't made an impact by January, then yeah. it's going to be, you know, you, you give him the benefit of the doubt, you think, right, he's going to be working under a completely different manager mm. who seems to have a bit of faith in him. Mm-hmm. It comes about talking about faith. There's got to be some kind of keep the faith. You've got to have keep the faith. Uh, who knows? With George Michael and uh, Yota. Yota. <laughs> Somebody out there who is far more creative than me will come up with something. Um, and what you've got there is a player who might have looked as though Ange could have turned his career around at Celtic, you know, in the early games. I know we watched the friendlies. Um, he was given the captain's armband. He scores the first goal I under Ange. Yeah, yeah. He that looks seems fitter. like ages ago, doesn't it? I know. <laughs> he looks leaner. Jesus. Uh, but it's not quite got going. We've gone out, we've signed a player who was a top goal scorer in Dutch football last season. So, um, you know, if a Yeti doesn't make an impact, in the, in the coming months and up until January, you're, you're then looking at, you know, for, it's best for all parties to move him on mm. at that stage. Unfortunately, because you look at the pedigree before he comes to sell it, other than a spell at West Ham and he's obviously got something, it just might not be the right fit, JP. Well, I mean, Edward's gone, Griffiths is gone. There's there's opportunities there. There's got to be. He's He's now part of an elite band of players that are strikers for Celtic. Mm. There's not many of them, is there? I mean, we've got... Kyogo Furuhashi, Giacomakis, Ayeti, and who else? That, that's really it. And As a striker. You, yeah, you're then playing, I know Abada and Yota can play through the middle, but you're playing guys out of their yeah. natural positions. Then. Yeah, I would. I know Yota said he can play through the middle as a false nine or whatever, but you know he's been signed as a winger. Surely that's what I, all the stuff I've read is that he's a winger. So yeah. to start playing him up front, he doesn't look like a striker um, at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, a Yeti is is now got you know a clear path in front of him. He's not got Edward in front of him anymore. He never really had Griffiths in front of him. Um, so uh, it's, it's up to him. Let's, uh, let's see what we ever. can do. Aye. The time is now. Uh, always an absolute pleasure, JP. We're going to go away and film something now. So <laughs> look out for that because uh, in the rain, <laughs> in the rain, if, it, if it's still raining outside, uh, look out for that. That will be on the channel and on the socials by Monday. Uh, got to thank everybody for all your votes, all your support for Axon. It's an absolute pleasure to put the bulletin out on a daily basis and cover all the games, even though it means I can't get to the games at the moment. 
uh, which is unfortunate, JP, but we'll find a way somehow. We'll find a way for that. We'll find a way. Uh, I remember there was one year, actually, and I looked at, due to the work that I was doing at the time, the amount of games I missed on my season ticket, and it was horrific. You know, you oh, could, when you used to take the paper out, the, 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 when you used to rip the pages out? Right. As far back as that. Right. I wish I could find it because it was in a cracking wee um, kind of like plastic full leather wallet, my first season ticket. Right, I've got um, it. <laughs> which the 20 Minute Tim's boys have started sending out to the subscribers. And I, I commented that as a cracking bit of merch because it took me back to like ni- 1994. Yeah. And I also had an ID card, JP, oh, because right. I was under 16. I had an ID card, um, which was just like, that you would put in a lanyard or something, but it was part of the season ticket. But I don't know where it is. It'll be in a loft somewhere. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Uh, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Subscribe to YouTube. You could win one of these fantastic concept jerseys. I'm saying they're fantastic, JP. What's your favourite no, of the they, four? they are all minted. Uh, do you know what? I, I like the... I'm liking this one. See, I want like the green one next to that, mm. the, the one right behind you, um, just because it kind of looks like the Love Street Aye. kit. But not as shiny, but it's they look cracking just because it's embroidered badges, isn't it? Ah, it's like, old school, yeah, class retro. That's what we like. Thanks everybody for getting involved and join us again tomorrow. Tune in at 12 34 at Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>